Hello, and welcome to this special edition of Knowing Neurons. I'm here with Tom Albright, who is professor and director of the Vision Center Laboratory at the Salk Institute for Biological Sciences in La Jolla, California. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, as I understand it, your lab is interested in understanding the neural structures and events underlying visual perception. In other words, when you're walking down a busy street, how does your brain know what visual details to pay attention to and which to ignore? And why do some details catch your eye but are ignored by others? And how does your brain remember these things? These are multifaceted questions whose answers are quite complex. How do you go about studying the neural circuits of perception and memory? We use a combination of behavioral and physiological tools with human observers or with animal observers. You can simply have them look at visual stimuli and you can ask them what they see. And by manipulating the properties of the stimulus, that is the properties of the input to the visual system, you can get a pretty good idea about what factors control visual perceptual experience. We also use physiological tools to understand the brain bases of these visual perceptual experiences. And so in, in that mode, we are looking at the activity of cells, individual cells or small groups of cells in the visual system and looking at the correlations between that activity and one's visual perceptual experience. And, and as much as we can find those correlations, that's, uh, that enables an argument that that activity underlies one's visual perceptual experience of particular classes of stimuli. Got it. So why is your research important? Are there real world applications for the work? I know that you have some interest in psychiatric diseases like schizophrenia. Could you kind of explain how that ties in? Well, there are lots of potential real-world applications. The standard one, of course, for the field of neuroscience, the standard real-world application is, is medicine. Most neuroscience research is actually done for the purpose of understanding how the brain works so that we can facilitate medical practice, so we, we're in a better position to treat clinical disorders. Uh, and in my case, that would be clinical disorders of, of the nervous system. And you're correct, we have studied changes in sensory function that are associated with schizophrenia, for example. We we're trying to develop an animal model of schizophrenia using a pharmacological approach. But in addition to medicine, there are other real-world applications, and one that I've taken a great interest in recently is the forensic sciences. That is, many types of forensic evidence rely on what, what's called pattern matching, and these are forms of patterned evidence. Uh, fingerprints is a good example of that. Uh, bullet marks, rifle marks on a bullet uh, is another example. Footprints, tire treads, and whatnot. Uh, and these are examples in which there are patterns and a human observer, an expert forensic examiner, will make a judgment about whether two patterns came from the same source. So the obvious example there is fingerprints, and you have a forensic fingerprint that's gathered from a crime scene, and you have a, an exemplar print that's in some database someplace. And typically the way this is done is the computer will narrow down the set of possibilities the number of fingerprints in the, in the database that are possible matches with the one found at the crime scene. But the final decision is made by a person. That is, a forensic fingerprint examiner will look at the two prints, the forensic print and the exemplar print, and make a decision about whether they came from the same source. And so an understanding of how visual perception and how visual memory work is, is really fundamental to understanding why mistakes are made, and they are indeed made. Mm -hmm. um, the most famous case of that is the, the 2004 Madrid train bombing. Um, there was a suspect that was detained, a man by the name of Brandon Mayfield, who was a, a family practice lawyer in Portland, Oregon. And he was detained um, as the suspect for having caused this terrorist act in Madrid, which led to the death of nearly 200 people and injured considerably more and caused widespread property damage. Uh, it turns out Brandon Mayfield had never left the United States. Uh, he didn't have a U.S. passport, and this was a mistaken judgment on the part of three independently operating fingerprint examiners. So, th so it's an indication, in that case a, a really salient indication, that there are flaws in the system. And the argument here is that, again, in as much as we understand how the visual system works and how memory works, we're in a better position to avoid these kinds of mistakes.
Another example of that that I got greatly interested in recently was eyewitness identification. That's a case in which both visual perception and memory are called into play. You have to determine whether a face you see in a lineup is identical to a face that you've seen at a crime scene. There has long been suspicion that the system is flawed, deeply flawed, and there may be many innocent people who are in jail based on false identifications. This came to the fore recent, relatively recently as a result of work done by the Innocence Project, which is a legal advocacy group that uses DNA evidence to examine whether people who have served considerable time in prison are actually the people guilty for the crime. This is cases in which DNA was sitting on a shelf someplace with the advent of the polymerase chain reaction in the, in the 1980s, it became possible to amplify the DNA so that you could actually determine whether uh, that DNA matched somebody in a database or whether it matched the person who's actually in prison. But the Innocence Project has now, through that method, led to the exoneration of nearly 350 people. And in the vast majority of those cases, the person was convicted in part based on eyewitness, in this case, eyewitness misidentification. That is, an eyewitness came in and identified that, the wrong person. So this is another real-world application for neuroscience research, particularly neuroscience research on the visual system and system for memory. Absolutely. And this is actually going to be the topic of your neuroethics lecture at the Society for Neuroscience meeting this fall, where you're giving a talk entitled Reforming Forensic Sciences, Some Insights on Research from Vision and Memory. You know, this touches on some science policy issues as well, beyond the ethical concerns and public confidence in the criminal justice system in general. When you started thinking about being a scientist or what you were going to study in your lab, did you always see that this would be where things would be headed? No, not at all. Uh, when I entered the field of neuroscience, I entered it for sort of personal reasons. That I was, that is, I was interested in how visual perception worked. It seemed to me fascinating that you could simply open your eyes and all of a sudden everything was there, enough information to be able to make decisions, navigate through a complex environment, recognize things that you've seen before, recognize your friends. And this just seems extraordinary if you think about it. Most people just take it for granted. Uh, it's the open your eyes and the world is there. But it's a really hard problem, and the human visual system does it extraordinarily well. So that was my motivation. I was just curious about that. But the larger motivation for neuroscience research when I got into the field was primarily medicine. That is, if we understand how the brain works, we're in a better position to fix it when it breaks. And I didn't really start thinking about these other societal problems until relatively recently. About a decade ago, a little more than a decade ago, I got interested in the problem of architecture we build buildings for lots of reasons. We build buildings to provide shelter, to keep us warm, to keep the bugs out. But we also build buildings to satisfy the sort of inner needs of the people who, who live in those buildings, who work in those buildings. And there's long been an interest in understanding what it is about a good building that facilitates what people do in that building, makes them learn better, makes them heal better, uh, makes them better producers in a workplace. And Modern neuroscience is now at the point of having something to say about that. The great thing about the field that I work in, that is the neurobiology of visual perception and memory, is that visual perception and memory are very intimately related for, to most of the things that people do. And so in places where there are societal decisions based on judgments, visual perception and memory judgments, an understanding of how that system works can be very useful. It's always interesting to see how people's careers progress. Can you talk a little bit about why you wanted to become a scientist? Did you always want to be a scientist, or was it medicine that really drove you? Uh, it was not medicine that drove me. It was curiosity. I was um, My father was uh, an electrical engineer and, and really sort of a polymath. He was interested in all sorts of things. And my mother was a food scientist. She, was, she actually worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture when I was very young. It's a, a sort of experimenting with different kinds of food mixtures. So I was brought up in a household in which education was a priority and asking questions was a priority. 
and I was strongly encouraged by my parents, and particularly my father. My father died when I was quite young, when I was 14, but he uh, left an impression on me. And um, after stumbling around a little bit uh, when I was a teenager, I realized there were opportunities in the field of neuroscience, and I was eager to take up those opportunities. And so I, I enrolled in graduate school. I went to Princeton um, I was enrolled in the psychology department at Princeton, but there was a Princeton at that time, and actually still today, has a joint program in neuroscience. So my PhD is in psychology and neuroscience. What were you like in grad school? Is there a favorite memory you have? What was I like? I was sort of a nerdy, intense, relatively quiet graduate student. The lab I worked in, and this actually is something that left a strong impression on me, the lab I worked in, which was run by a man named Charlie Gross, who's well-known in the field of visual neuroscience for having made the discovery of what are called face cells in the visual cortex, the lab was extremely well integrated socially, and we sort of bonded together. And part of the way that we bonded is that every day we ate lunch together. There was a Brazilian postdoc in the lab who would uh, walk down the hall calling out, lunch, lunch, and then he would say it in, um, in Portuguese, which is, vamos almoçar. And we'd all sort of gather our food together and come down and have lunch in, um, in Charlie Gross's spacious office or sometimes out on the picnic table out behind the building that we worked in. And we would sit around and talk about you know, movies we'd seen or, or social political issues of major significance. And, and it was a very strong, for me, a very strong bonding experience and, and a way of learning about what other people are like. And it sort of reinforced, you know, science is hard work. And if you're going to do that kind of hard work, it's very important that you understand and trust and bond with the people you're working with. And this sort of communal social lunch left a very strong impression on me that way. It, it, it really helped me understand who the people were that I was working with, it, and which made everything smoother in the end. Have you uh, done this in your own lab, kind of carrying it forward? As a matter of fact, I have. So um, in my lab, I, I've been at the Salk Institute now for 30 years, and in my lab every day we all sit down together and have lunch. And we have the same sort of social conversations that we had when I was a graduate student at Princeton. And the interesting thing about that is that the Salk Institute at the west end of the building is this beautiful plaza with little tables set up and umbrellas. So you can sit out there overlooking the canyon, uh, which goes down to the Pacific Ocean, and have lunch outside. But as a result of this practice that, you know, I don't enforce this in the laboratory, but people just grab onto it. This communal lab lunch and everybody sits down together but we do it inside in one of the little meeting rooms in the laboratory it's a social experience that that reinforces strong bonds between the people who work in the laboratory that sounds wonderful what did you do after grad school can you explain how you got to where you are at the sulk so i did an unusual thing today most people will get their phd and then do a postdoctoral stint at a different institution learning something different. And I, for a whole variety of reasons, decided to stay at Princeton as a postdoctoral fellow. And moreover, I decided to stay in the same laboratory. And part of the reason for that was that the field I was working in was switching from studies of anesthetized preparations to behaving animals. And so this was a big opportunity for me to learn this new technique. And the other advantage I had at Princeton was that the guy who ran the laboratory, that is Charlie Gross, gave me pretty much free reign. Um, you know, he provided inspiration and ideas, and we talked regularly about the experiments, but he sort of set things up such that I could do experiments of my own design. And this was, this was great. It gave me autonomy. It gave me the chance to learn new techniques and have new experiences and it was it was sort of ideal nowadays if some if a job candidate came along and had done a, um, a PhD and a postdoc in the same laboratory they would be frowned upon but it, it really worked out well in my case yeah so after doing a postdoc at Princeton I had been there about three years as a postdoc four years as a graduate student and three years as a postdoc and I started to go on the job market and th there weren't many jobs in neuroscience in those days uh, and there were a small number of people, I knew them all, who were applying for all these jobs, and so we were all competing with one another. I got invited for an interview at the Salk Institute in San Diego, California, 
And I, at the time, I didn't really know much about the Salk Institute. Uh, at that time, this was in 1986, the Salk Institute was founded in the early 1960s. And so it was really not much more than 25 years old and a, a private biomedical research institute right across the street from the University of California, San Diego campus. And I, of course, knew about Jonas Salk. Everybody knew about Jonas Salk. He was a national hero. And so I came out for this interview at the Salk Institute, and there were two significant things about that interview experience. One was uh, Francis Crick was on the faculty, and Francis Crick was, if not the, the sort of practical leader of the search committee, he was sort of the inspirational leader of the search committee for the job I had applied for. And I talked to him at length about the work I was doing on the visual system, and he was very excited by it. The other significant thing about that interview experience, again, this is 1986, was it was very clear that the SOC had chosen to develop systems neuroscience, had chosen to develop a research program with multiple labs looking at how large systems in the brain operate, and the system that had been identified for this was the visual system. And it's an obvious choice because at the time it was, it is, and still is the system we know the most about. Uh, and it's the system that uh, as human beings, we rely upon most of our waking hours for most of the things that we do. So it's um, those, you know, Francis Crick being here is a source of inspiration and knowing that the SOC really wanted to develop this kind of research program were very exciting points for me. Um, and I left thinking, well, this would be great. Uh, I lived in New Jersey. I you know, was born on the East Coast and I spent all my life on the East Coast. And um, a week later, I got a call from the guy who was actually the head of the search committee, a man by the name of Simon LaVey, who was a prominent vision scientist at the time. And Simon called me up and said that, uh, that they wanted to hire me. And, uh, and of course, I had to, you know, the, I, I, I didn't want to, <laughs> I didn't want to seem too eager, so I, which is ridiculous, of course, because I was extremely excited by the offer. Uh, but I said, okay, well, that's wonderful. I'll think about it for a couple of days. And I, I went away and talked to a few people about it, and because it did, after all, mean me move, moving to California, which was, in those days, again, the mid-1980s, that seemed like moving to another planet, so, although I was excited by it. I was a little naive about California, but I called him back a few days later and said that I would love to accept the offer, and a few months later, I moved to California, and I've been here ever since. <laughs> That's great. So looking back at where you were when you started this whole journey, what were some of the unexpected hurdles during your career? I don't think that there were any hurdles that were unexpected. There are hurdles, certainly. Right. Um, there are things that are really hard, and there are frustrations, you know, like the frustration of having a paper rejected by an irrational referee or having a grant rejected for the wrong reasons. Those are difficult things to face. Um, they call into question your suitability for what you're doing. Uh, you get a rejection like that, and you think, because, of course, if you're rational about it, the first thing you do is, is question yourself, not question the, the referee. You know, you get, you get over with that, and the important thing to keep in mind is that it's just one step along the way and that there are many other positive things that happen. You have to be, in science, you have to be prepared for not having continual reinforcement. So there are long sort of dry spells between reinforcement. And a lot of the reinforcement, and this is still true to some degree, although probably less so than it used to be, a lot of it is just happening to be in the right place at the right time. And I chose a particular path mainly because I was interested in it. I was curious about how visual perception worked. I worked in a laboratory as an undergraduate. I was at the University of Maryland. I did an undergraduate thesis in the laboratory of a man by the name of Bill Hodos, who's a well-known comparative neurobiologist. And when I was thinking of going to graduate school, he advised me. He said, well, you know, there's this new technique. Uh, it involves recording activity from single cells in the cerebral cortex and relating them to the properties of the visual input. And this is going to pay off big. It's a great new technique. Um, it was pioneered, of course, by David Hubel and Torsten Weasel, um, who did most of their work at Harvard University in the neurobiology department, and it's work for which they later won the Nobel Prize. So I was very inspired by this, and, and this is the direction that Bill was, was directing me to. 
And so that's what I wanted to learn in graduate school. And uh, so I got good advice by, by Bill Hodos when I worked in Charlie Gross's lab at Princeton. Uh, I, you know, I developed a relationship with him that was good for both of us. I mean, he was very good about supporting me and advising me, and I helped him run the laboratory. And it was, um, again, one of those cases where I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I, I think I had what it took to be successful at it. I had determination. I was smart enough. But, you I know, mean, that's not enough. You also have to be fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time so that you can take advantage of the skills that you have or the intellect that you have. Yes, absolutely. I agree that luck is a big part in science, but mentorship is also a huge part in getting good advice and following it, following through with it. If you could give our listeners one piece of advice about anything, I guess, related to your professional development, what would it be? Do something that you find interesting. The field of neuroscience is very competitive today. Uh, it's hard to get into it. And many people are going into the field. That's, that's part of the problem, although that's a good thing for advances in our understanding of how the brain works. It's a problem because it becomes very competitive. There are a limited number of jobs. In fact, the, you can easily make an argument that the resources, the number of jobs, the, uh, the number of the amount of grant funds available to support neuroscience research is, is simply not up to the demand given the number of people who go into the field. And increasingly, people who get PhDs in neuroscience go off and do other things rather than sort of academic neuroscience, that is, the, rather than taking on a job where they run a laboratory in an academic research institute or a university. So given that it's very hard and given that it's highly competitive, the only way to survive is to do something that you get excited about, that, that every day you get up and, you know, there's these interesting questions about how the brain works and you have the tools to be able to answer them. And that's very exciting. And that has to be the thing that drives you, that, you know, it's not prestige, it's not the money. It has to be the excitement of basic research, the excitement of finding out something new, something that, that wasn't known before. And something that you can then relate to larger issues like medicine or, in my more recent case, um, to forensic sciences, for example. I think that's perfect advice. Thank you. Now, talking about neuroscience field as a whole, what do you think is the most compelling neuroscience discovery or new technique that has advanced the field the most in the last five years? Well, the technique that everybody's playing with right now, of course, is optogenetics. But I think more generally, the use of... Uh, so I, I was trained and I work in the field of systems neuroscience. And systems neuroscience, of course, is the neuroscience of large brain systems, like the visual system. And when I got into the field of neuroscience, there was sort of a, a separate parallel track, which was molecular and cellular neuroscience. And in those cases, people are primarily studying how individual cells in the nervous system work the nature of signaling within cells and between cells, but not really thinking of those cells as part of some larger system. And so the thing that's happened in the past 20 years, but you know, it, the, the rate of progress is increasing very rapidly, is bridging that gap between systems and cellular molecular neuroscience. And, and that gap is bridged um, both conceptually and technically. Conceptually, it's now the case that people like me, who have no formal training in molecular biology, now understand the significance of particular molecular biology discoveries for how the larger system works. And conversely, people who work in the field of cellular and molecular neuroscience appreciate the fact that ultimately the questions, the big question we want to ask is, how does vision work? How do we understand language? How do we remember things? I mean, those are the real big questions in the field of neuroscience. So ultimately relating signaling pathways within and between neurons to that, those larger questions is really fundamental. So that's a sort of conceptual bridging of that gap. But there's also a technical bridging of that gap that is using techniques from molecular and cellular biology to manipulate the nervous system. And so there were techniques that involve manipulating gene expression in certain classes of cells. There's a collaboration with my colleague Ed Calloway here at the Salk Institute. There's an insect uh, neuropeptide hormone known as elatostatin. So using the gene for the receptor 
for that hormone loaded into a virus, and the virus is injected into the central nervous system of a, of a mammal, uh, the gene is expressed, and so you end up with these receptors that are produced, and, and they sit on the um, cell membrane, and they're G-protein coupled to potassium channels, so if they're activated, they can hyperpolarize the cell, make it less likely to spike. And it turns out, of course, that there is no elatostatin in the mammalian brain. This is an insect hormone receptor, so there's no endogenous ligand for that receptor. So we can introduce the ligand exogenously by injecting it into the brain and look at how that affects the activity of those cells and then more broadly look at how knocking out that group of cells affects the function of the larger system the visual system in this case. And so we did experiments along those lines. A few years later, uh, the technique of optogenetics was developed, and so we've taken that up as well as a way to manipulate the nervous system so that we can see what happens when you unplug particular cellular elements from the larger computational machinery. That's pretty fascinating. You kind of touched on how important it is to collaborate with fellow neuroscientists. Is that a key part to becoming a successful neuroscientist? I think that that's increasingly part of the landscape of modern biomedical research. There, there are techniques coming from lots of different directions. In my case, coming from molecular biology and genetics. There are techniques coming from bioengineering. There are sort of theoretical techniques coming from the field of physics and computation. And I don't have expertise in all of those areas, and so I thrive by collaborating with people who do. And, and this is one of the beautiful things about the institution that I work at, the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, is it's a small institution. There, are, I think at the moment there's something on the order of about 45 to 50 active faculty members, and we represent a broad range of different kinds of experimental techniques and questions. And so I can go across the courtyard and talk to my molecular biology friends um, about a technique that I might be able to apply to study the nervous system. Or I can go down the hall and talk to um, my physics and computation friends about some techniques that might be used to develop a, a, a model of how the nervous system actually computes something that I'm measuring empirically. So it, absolutely, those those opportunities for collaboration with people who have rich skills that, that I don't have are really not just the key to survival, but the key to, to thriving in the field. And I think that this will more and more be the case as neuroscience develops. Well, I can tell that when you get up in the morning, you're, uh, I guess, extremely passionate about answering the questions about visual perception and memory but when you're not in the lab, what can you be found doing? I, I build stuff. You know, one of the reasons I got into science was because I like to work with my hands. And, of course, now I don't really do experiments anymore. I run a laboratory, so I don't really work in a lab with my hands anymore. But I work at home, and so I own a, a big piece of property, and uh, I just build stuff and I'm constantly sort of refurbishing my house, renovating things and, you know, stuff to just sort of experiment with ideas. A few years ago, I decided I wanted to build, my, my house is built on a, a hill. It's not a steep hill, but it's a hill. And the front yard is slightly sloped. And so I had this idea that I wanted to build a, a retaining wall and make it sort of terraced rather than sloped. And I got the idea, a crazy idea, that I wanted to build this retaining wall out of poured concrete. And most people wanting to build a retaining wall, if they wanted to build one at all, would go to Home Depot and, and get these little blocks that you stack up and use that to hold back the dirt. But in the environment I'm in, the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, I'm surrounded by this beautiful concrete, and I've just come to appreciate it over the years. And so I wanted to experiment with it, um, building something big out of concrete. And so I did a bunch of experiments with little, little things I made out of concrete. And then, of course, the problem is if you want to build something big, you have to basically make a mold because concrete is liquid when it's formed. And you build a mold, which is called the form for the concrete, and then you pour the concrete in to that mold. And so my retaining wall uh, was going to be 45 feet long, 3.5 feet wide, and 8 inches thick, which is a lot of concrete. And, and then I got this idea that I was going to embed pieces of opaque colored glass in the front of this retaining wall. Uh, and I worked at this whole pattern, you know, I like designing things like that, the whole pattern of this, this colored glass and this sort of semi-random pattern on the front. 
and I built the forms. And it sat there in the front of my yard for years to the point where I was oblivious to it. I would you know, drive up to my house and, and I wouldn't even notice all this, you know, this construction site in my front yard. And so finally I decided I wanted to finish it. And I did a um, little over a year ago. I hired somebody to come out and pour the concrete and it came out beautifully. It came out exactly the way that I envisioned it. And so this was you know, a lot of time, a lot of sort of frustration along the way. But in the end, it's extremely satisfying to know that I basically built this gigantic thing, and it weighs many tons. It's five cubic yards of concrete, <laughs> and it's not going to go away anytime soon. And it's there in the front of my yard. And it could have failed at multiple points along the way, but it actually looks beautiful. The colored glass worked out really well. So I like doing stuff like that. I built my own dining table great big nine-foot dining table. I built a working fireplace, stone fireplace in my backyard and so on. You chose a very difficult project for your hobby. Yeah, it's very satisfying. And And it satisfies that particular need I have to be able to do stuff with my hands. I wouldn't presume to say I'm an artist, but I do like to design things and, and see them actually done. And I'm fearless about this kind of thing. They say, well, this is not really a do-it-yourself project. That's not going to stop me. I'll learn about it, and then I'll just do it. Because that's the way science works, too. You know, nobody's going to come and say, well, you can't do that experiment. You don't know, how to, you don't know what you're doing. Because, of course, I'll learn how to do it. So we've come to the lightning round. These are really quick questions, but your answers don't have to be short. All right? Okay. So coffee or tea? Coffee. What's your go-to comfort food? Fish and chips. What is your favorite book? My favorite book? Oh, gosh. I read novels most of the time. Well, I, I couldn't say that any particular one was my favorite because there are lots of things. I read novels mainly because I read at work. I read, I read nonfiction all the time. And so reading novels uh, is an escape that I have. I've, I've always, my entire adult life, I've just been obsessively reading novels. And so if you asked a different question, and so I'll pretend you asked a different question, not what's my favorite, but what's a book that left a very strong impression on me. And I would say it's, a, it's sort of an extraordinary book. It's called Infinite Jest. It's by the um, author David Foster Wallace, who was for many years considered to be one of the, the brilliant young novelists. He killed himself, gosh, about... I don't know, six or seven years ago, I forget exactly when, uh, which was tragic. I mean, he was young at the time, I think maybe 47 or so. And he wrote this sort of staggeringly brilliant novel in the 1990s called Infinite Jest. And it's, a, you know, it's about a thousand pages and has about a thousand footnotes, all of which are interesting. The theme that runs throughout it is addiction. Addiction in all its manifestations and how it affects people's behavior and the decisions that they make. And, and I found that you know, part of this is, this is a phenomenon in psychology known as cognitive dissonance. If you read a thousand-page novel, of course, you're going to be particularly satisfied with that novel because otherwise you'd say, well, why did I read the entire thing if it wasn't great? But in fact, this one was great, and it caused me to think about things in a new and different way. That's a great choice. What gadget can you not live without? Oh, my coffee machine. I have this fantastic (laughs) coffee machine. I got one in the laboratory about 15 years ago. It's made by a Swiss company called Jura. It's J-U-R-A in any case. And this coffee machine makes the best cup of coffee. It can make espresso, double espresso, or a regular, like an Americano, but it makes the coffee fresh. The beans are freshly ground for every cup. It pushes the hot water through at just the right pressure and the right temperature, and it makes a fantastic cup of coffee. Yeah, that sounds like something I need in my life. (laughs) Where would you like to visit but haven't been yet? Antarctica, and I'm going there in December. I wasn't actually planning to go to Antarctica, but I have a, uh, a good friend, actually my PhD thesis advisor, Charlie Gross, who I've stayed close with and have traveled a lot with around the world. He's traveled pretty much everywhere except Antarctica, and he decided that he wanted to go there. He wanted a traveling companion, and so he invited me to join him. And so I'm going to the Antarctic Peninsula. Wow, what an adventure. Well, those are all the questions I have for you. 
thanks so much for speaking with me, and uh, look for this on Knowing Neuron soon. Okay. Well, thank you very much for including me. That concludes this special edition of Knowing Neurons. Don't miss Tom's talk on Monday, November 14th at 10 a.m. at the Society for Neuroscience Annual Meeting in San Diego. See you there.